Are we ready to go? Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. I see we have a number of people logging on now. Um, happy to have you on with us for this webinar series. Uh, this is Swaco's From Waste to Resources webinar series. Um, this one is focusing on preventing food waste at home. Um, so my name is Lucy Schroeder. I am Food Waste Initiative Coordinator for Swaco. Um, so here's the food waste expert, um, but I brought on a couple members of our team as well. We have Andrew Booker here. Um, he's Programs Manager with Swaco, um, and he's going to help me with answering questions as we move through the program and introducing Swaco um, and our background. Um, and then we have Chef Fernando Mojica. Um, who is joining us um, to provide his expertise in the food world and some tips and tricks and recipes along the way um, on how we can reduce food waste at home and save money in the process. Um, and so I want everyone to feel free to share any questions you have that pop up along the way. Um, Andrew will do his best to answer those using the chat function. Um, if he doesn't get to it, we'll, or if it's a question that he thinks would be a good one for the, for the audience to hear as well. Um, he'll hold it off until um, a question period and then we can answer it together. Um, so, but before we get going, um, Andrew's going to share a little bit about this GoToWebinar platform, um, just so that we can all make sure we're, we're understanding how to um, submit our questions and um, participate in the webinar today. So, Andrew, take it away. Thank you, Lucy. Appreciate it. Um, as Lucy said, my name is Andrew Booker. I'm a programs manager here at Twico. I'm going to spend most of the evening kind of in the background uh, helping to facilitate some of the webinar, but I do want to point out a couple of things for you. Uh, if you're new to using GoToWebinar, there's a, just an important feature that I want you to pay attention to. You should see on your screen a control panel, and it, can, it should be on the right-hand side of your screen has a little orange arrow, um, and if it collapses, it'll just look like a little vertical gray bar. You click that orange arrow and it should expand. And there are two important uh, items on that control panel that you'll see. One is called audio, and one is called questions and chat. And if you will click on that questions and chat one, and we'll just flip to the next um, slide here. If you click on that little, white triangle by questions and chat, it'll open up a chat box where you can ask us questions. So it brings us to an important point, which is that all of our participants are muted. So we will not be able to hear you speak tonight. So we will have a few sections of the presentation where we'll pause and we'll, we'll be taking and answering your questions. But as Lucy said at any time during the presentation, feel free to ask a question. We'll do our best throughout the, the webinar to answer them as we go as well. So. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and so before we kick it off, just want to share a little bit about where we're going so that um, nobody's lost along the way. Um, I'm going to open things up and Andrew will assist with giving a little background on Swaco and the work that we do in Franklin County um, for waste diversion, as well as um, taking a little extra focus on our food waste work. Um, and the food waste reduction efforts happening across central Ohio. Um, and we'll transition into what you can do to help. And the majority of our time tonight will be spent um, speaking with Chef Mojica about um, what we can do to prevent food waste from the start and what we can do to rescue and recover food um, right before it becomes food waste and still get the best utility out of it. And so at the end, we'll have a good opportunity to share any questions. If you have that specific item you've always wanted to know how to store, um, or that tricky thing to use up that's frequently going to waste in your refrigerator. Um, save up those questions and um, we'll address those at the end or shoot them over to Andrew and he can um, answer your question along the way. Um, and so first off, I would like to introduce our guest, Chef Fernando Mojica. Um, Chef Mojica has been recognized locally and nationally by the American Culinary Federation as well as others. Um, his current role is with Degrees Restaurant, um, which is part of Columbus State Community College. So welcome, Chef, um, and if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your current role um, with Degrees. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Lucy mentioned, I'm uh, Chef Fernando Mojica. So I'm part of the hospitality, um, the School of Hospitality Arts and Culinary Management at uh, Columbus State Community College. We are um, part of the community college organization. Uh, we have seven majors within our program. Uh, we have culinary arts degree, uh, culinary arts apprentice, uh, 
bacon and pastry, food management, um, tourism, nutrition and dietetics. Um, we also run a uh, non-credit program called The Mix where the general public can come in and take classes. And those are more designed for uh, just the home cook, the, the person that doesn't want to be a chef for, for a career, but wants to learn a little bit more about cooking and, and beverage and a bunch of other things. Um, I run, um, my role encompasses uh, being the executive chef for the Grace Restaurant. Uh, so we have a brand new facility. Uh, we've been in there for just about a year or so, um, have about eight, eight kitchen, teaching kitchens. Uh, we have a hundred person culinary theater, and then we have a full service restaurant that's open to the public, uh, as well as a uh, bakery and cafe that's also open to the public. And the students, um, it is professionally managed, but myself and other chefs and the students actually are the ones that are working on the restaurant and the uh, cafe as part of their class work so it's a really neat uh, experience they get to have real life experience um, and uh, one cool thing that we like to brag about is uh, that ties up really well to these seminar is that we don't have any um, garbage disposals at the building so that gives us the uh, ability to separate all the waste and do compost to eliminate as much as possible uh, so about a total of about 20 kitchens and none of them have a have a food disposal on it. So we like to brag about that. Thank you, Chef, and we're really excited to have you here with us today. I understand it sounds like it's a big job over at Columbus State, um, but I hear you're also new to the Columbus area. You've been here for a little over a year now. Um, tell us what it is that you love about the Columbus food scene. That's correct, Lucy. Um, when I moved to Columbus back in uh, January 2019, and um, one thing that I like is it's a great food city. You know, uh, it's really up and coming. Um, anything that you can think of, anything that you might want as far as food or culinary or ingredients or cuisines, you can find in Columbus um, or around Columbus. So I, it's one of the things that I, that drew me here. It's um, just a really up and coming city as far as uh, ma making big moves in the culinary world. Great. That's awesome to hear and exciting for people to eat out here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so we're going to take a pause from Chef Mojica for just a moment to provide a little bit of background about Swaco, um, and then we'll come back to him in just a few minutes. So Aaron, for a moment here um, to share a little bit about Swaco and our work with uh, Waste Diversion. Thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, as, as Lucy said, I'm just going to take a couple minutes here to try to familiarize folks with SWACO. Um, SWACO stands for the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. Well, we actually were created in 1989 as a result of a state law that requires all counties in Ohio to be part of what is called a Solid Waste Management District or a Solid Waste Management Authority. Uh, and as a Solid Waste Authority, we're required to assure that the waste generated in Franklin County is managed in a responsible manner. Um, we also are, are required to re assure that there's adequate landfill capacity for the waste that we have to throw away. Most importantly, we're required to develop and implement programs to divert waste materials from landfills and into more suitable, more sustainable options such as recycling and composting. As a result of this, we have uh, quite a number of programs that we offer uh, at Swaco. And so the next slide is gonna show a series of pictures that just kind of illustrate some of them. I'm not gonna have time to really go into great detail about all of these, but I just wanna give folks a little flavor for all the things that we do. Um, and let's start out maybe with that picture of the person pushing a recycling cart to the curb. It's one of the things that, that we do here at Swaco is we work with all 41 communities in Franklin County to try to help them improve and establish really effective recycling programs, curbside recycling programs primarily. It's just one example of this. We recently created a recycling cart grant program. And through that program uh, in 2019, we helped Reynoldsburg, Gahanna, Westerville, Bexley, and Blendon Township purchase recycling carts for their residents and greatly improve their recycling program as a, as a result of that. Below that, you'll see a picture of a few of our recycling drop-offs that are available to all residents in Franklin County. These are free, available for folks in particular that don't have curbside recycling, but they can also be used by those that do. We have over 50 of these locations throughout the city to provide free access to, to recycling for folks. We also have free yard waste composting available to Franklin County residents, and that's through a couple of contracts that Swaco holds, and that really helps uh, support both the programs that were, if you have 
curbside collection of yard waste, but it also allows residents to drive to these compost facilities and drop off materials. Below, below that, you'll see a picture of some scrap tires and we have something called the Environmental Crimes Task Force. And we work, we partner very closely with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office and the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office. We have a website and a, and a hotline that any resident of Franklin County can use to report illegal dumping and those reports will be investigated and prosecuted when appropriate. Um, we also help communities um, recycle electronic waste that they generate at their government buildings and also uh, some, temp some mobile collection events for residents. We have a permanent household hazardous waste collection location as well. It's at the corner of East of 8th Avenue and Essex near the fairgrounds. It's available uh, throughout the week for residents uh, to safely dispose of the kind of chemicals and other uh, hazardous materials that they may find in their garage, basement, attic, that kind of thing. And just two more that I'll touch on. We have a container loan program uh, kind of illustrated in that picture to the right. It's a program that allows event organizers, communities, and others to rent recycling containers for free uh, so that they can provide recycling as an option at their uh, public events, outdoor events and, and other types of events. And finally, we host over 4,000 students down to uh, the landfill to do a landfill tour. They get a presentation on what they can do to um, prevent waste from going to the landfill. And as I mentioned, 4,000 students a year. And also we do uh, several community events a year where we just allow the general public to come tour the landfill. That is really just a small sampling of the many things that we offer. I really encourage folks to get on Swaco.org to, to learn about all of the other programs that we have available as well. Back to you, Lucy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and so now the question remains, why is Swaco interested in food waste? And why should each of us be interested in food waste? And so here in Central Ohio, as part of Swaco's waste characterization study, process. So we've set a goal as an organization, we want to divert 75% of material from landfills. And so it's important to be accomplishing that goal to understand what's coming in every day. And so this graph is showing here, um, we have the number one material entering the landfill in central Ohio by weight is food, making up 15% of the material coming in every day. And so Andrew's going to share a poll with each of you. And so you can select the answer that you think is correct. Um, of that 15% of food waste coming into the landfill, how much food waste enters the landfill in central Ohio in just one day? And so instead of talking about percentages, we're looking at pounds now. Andrew, you can go ahead and share that poll. All right, Lucy, so let's see. Uh, here's the question again. How many pounds of food are landfilled per day in central Ohio? Uh, you should be able to click on your computer screen participants and um, and vote. And I'm going to monitor here just for a few seconds to see um, once we get maybe to over 50% voting, oh, it's filling up quickly. So we're about 51%. Let's just give it a few more seconds. Take your best guess. Votes are coming in and let's just see what what the answers are. Yeah, wow, looks good here. So um, the answer is 1 million pounds of food are coming into the landfill every single day. And so it looks like we were pretty split up on what we thought this number might be. Um, this to me, every time I'm reminded this million pounds every day, it's pretty astounding um, to think about the opportunity that's being lost here. And so, I'll share just a couple of these things that were, a couple of these reasons that we're looking at food waste as an organization. Um, we wanna recapture environmental resources for our community. And so here's a little bit of what's being lost when we lose food. Um, 22 million gallons of gasoline are used every year in the process of transporting that food um, from the farm to your plate. Uh, 41 billion gallons of water are used in the growing process as well as the preparation process, turning wheat into bread. Um, as well as 160,000 acres of land is used just in the space that's used to grow food that is then thrown away. And so that's about half the area of Franklin County. If we can reclaim all these environmental resources, um, we'll make a big difference for our planet, but we can also make a big difference for our community. Um, so here in Central Ohio, um, 
that million pounds a day of food being landfilled equates to about 192 million meals every year. And so our community sees about 69 million meals being missed by our residents. And so I think when you have those two numbers together, it paints a really clear picture of the opportunity lost here. If we can capture all of that excess food before it becomes waste, um, we can really do a good service for our community. Also, uh, there is a significant financial loss when food is sent to the landfill. Uh, just the tipping fee alone, the process of putting that food into the landfill, costs our community $6 million a year, as well as at a really low estimate, we think that upwards of $106 million is lost by our community in food waste. And so we see that there's a lot of motivation, re good reason to be thinking about food and how we can prevent it from going to waste. And that's why Swaco developed the Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative. We know that we can't solve the food waste problem on our own, so we decided to bring all kinds of partners with us. Um, here's just a little smattering and sample of a few of the partners who we have as part of the Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative, as well as many others. Um, we have local partners as, and as well as national ones. And we all came together and said, let's make a goal to cut the cent Central Ohio's food waste in half by 2030. And so we put that goal into writing with the Central Ohio Food Waste Action Plan, along with 20 solutions of how we are going to get there as a community. And so you're welcome to go online, either swaco.org or, or coffee.org, which is Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative, um, to read the entire action plan. But I am just going to share um, kind of the thinking that we have behind our solutions. So, and this is the same process that you can use at home, and I'll review that in just a moment. But First, we think about prevention. If we're looking at our community and our biggest opportunity to preserve natural resources as well as resources for our community members, um, the best thing you can do is to buy less in the first place and keep food from going to waste. Um, but human error is everywhere, and so we can't do this all the time. Um, so the next best option is food rescue. Can we donate to those in need in our community? When that's not possible, when the food is just too far gone to be feeding to other people, and then we look at opportunities for recycling. Um, can we compost this food? Can we feed it to animals? Can we use anaerobic digestion? Um, and only when those processes are not of options um, should we then look to the landfill to dispose of our food. Um, and just one other quick plug, um, Swaco is coming out and the Central Ohio Food Waste Initiative is coming out with a food waste awareness campaign um, in the next several months. And so we're really excited this, uh, the campaign, Save More Than Food, We'll have resources for residents, for things that you can do at home, all the things you need to know about local composting partners, um, how recipes, tips and tricks, um, in addition to the content that we're reviewing today. Um, but we'll also have information for what you can do in your workplace, what you can do at your schools, um, what you can do in food businesses. And so I encourage each of you to check that out once it's live in the next several months. And then that brings us back to our content for today. We're thinking about what each of us can do to help reduce our food waste at home. And so the, you'll see that we have the same hierarchy, but kind of adapted for an individual. Um, the best thing that you can do is prevention. You can shop smart, um, store your food correctly, and keep to your schedule to reduce your food waste and save the most money with prevention methods. Um, and Chef Mojica is gonna help us talk a little bit more about that, as well as um, food rescue methods, which are things like um, so I'm not going to get to use these greens in the way that I thought I was, but maybe if I make it into this new recipe, um, it'll get used up faster and we can prevent it from going to waste that way. When that's not an option, um, there's always uh, the make your dog's day method. And so many foods that we eat are fine to feed to your pets. I would encourage each of you, if you're going to try this option out, talk to your vet about some of the basics um, of what you should and should not feed to your pet. We all know chocolate. Another one is onions that you shouldn't give to dogs. So check with your vet, but this can be a really great option as well. Um, then there's all kinds of compost. Uh, Swaco has many resources for composting as well as another webinar that we've previously recorded. So feel free to reach out if you have questions about composting and we can help you out there as well. Um, but today we'll focus mostly on prevention and rescue. And so with that, I'm going to invite Chef Fernando back and we'll launch into this conversation about food waste prevention. And so I'm really excited to have Chef with us today because um, this is a big part of what his job is as the executive director or executive chef in a restaurant. 
Um, he's looking to save the restaurant money, but also provide the best experience possible for his customers. And so again, anyone, if you have questions, um, submit those in through the chat function. And before we get started, Andrew, do you have any questions um, that you're seeing that you would like to share with us at, at the moment? I don't have any, I don't have any yet. Uh, we'll maybe touch on a couple of them towards the end of the, of the end of the event. Great, thank you. Um, so Chef Fernando, first question for you. Um, what is a lesson that you have learned about meal prep in the restaurant that you carry over into your home kitchen? Uh, thank you, Lucy. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my career is uh, just being able to utilize um, all the ingredients that we bring into the restaurant um, in different ways to prevent food waste, right? So one of the things that we like to do at the restaurants and I've, I've done before in other kitchens, I've been utilizing some those of um, ingredients that might not be completely you know beautiful to put on a plate right so think of like an apple that's starting to get a little bruised or a butternut squash that's uh, you know a little bit on the softer side but still good and edible and it flavor is there um utilizing those in different ways right making a puree out of it making a sauce out of it making a dressing out of it um so you know it doesn't need to look pretty it just you just need the flavor at that point so that's that's one way that we do it um and then the other way is to um try to utilize everything that we possibly can, right? So if we're talking to, for example, we're talking about a chicken, um, rather than buying uh, prefabricated or, or pre-butchered chickens, well, maybe you're getting the opportunity to buy a whole chicken and utilizing that as, uh, you know, the chicken breast for one dinner maybe, and then the, the thighs and the legs maybe for another dinner, uh, maybe utilize the bones to make stock. And so we, we utilize, um, as much of the product as possible uh, and to prevent food waste. Great. And so it sounds like what we're doing here is we're taking kind of a holistic look at our week. We're thinking um, if I'm going to, if I'm looking to have chicken for dinner one night, how can I um, then use those leftovers or what else I've purchased to make, make a delicious meal the next night? So um, yeah, like that example, a chicken breast one night, chicken thighs the next, soup on Friday. That's a great approach. And I think um, something I've learned personally um, is when you're at the grocery store, many, many grocery stores have options where you can shop in their discounted produce section. Um, so you'll find those apples that are a little bruised or that, that zucchini that's got a, an odd shape or something. Um, but it's a great opportunity to save money. And um, often the, the, those foods would otherwise go to waste. And so it's also a great food waste reduction tactic. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then take just a moment, Chef, if you could. So let's talk about um, when we're preparing a chicken, we're trying to use this uh, food waste reduction tactic of using the whole animal. Um, now I've used the chicken breast, I've used the chicken thighs, and I'm left with just the bones. Um, what should I do with the bones then? Great question, Lisa, right? So one of the things that we do at the restaurant is uh, we make our own stocks. Um, and what a stock is, it is just essentially the bones of a chicken or the bones of a veal um, or um, even fish, uh, vegetables and so on, um, just basically cooked over a low simmer for a long period of time and with the doses that releases um, a lot of the nutrition, the nutrients that are in them, um, it releases all the flavor that's on the on the bones and, and so on. And so um, that will be then what we use as a base to create our sauces, to create our soups, to create our um, you know, braces and so on. So that's one of the things that we like to do to, again, prevent um, food waste and to, to try to eliminate how much we're spending on items uh, and try to, you know, and I do that at home as well. Yeah, and so when we're putting together that stock, we have the bones in the pot, we've filled up the pot with water to cover up the bones. Um, what are some other common ingredients that you would throw in there as well? Uh, so normally you will, you know, start with your bones and your water, uh, simmer those for a couple of hours, and then you normally add um, some onions, or, or in this case, onion peels. You know, again, you have those onions that that you made for dinner, and you know now you're gonna, you know, find something to do with the peels. Um, some carrots, some celery, a little bit of bay leaves, uh, some aromatics, thyme, parsley, uh, black peppercorn, and that's it. So it's super simple to make. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not very intimidating, but again, it incorporates the whole 
food prevention and uh, and reducing uh, cost for for you know when you're cooking at home. Yeah, yeah, and so I know um, in a previous conversation that you and I had about um, kind of these easy fixes and easy things to do. Another one was also um, just buying the right quantity. Uh, so this is a tricky one, and I think it's probably very different for you as a chef. Um, to kind of estimate those quantities than it is for us at home. And so tell us a little bit about what you've learned from, about estimating those food amounts, and then I'll share a resource that I think is really great for at home. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I do, um, and it just comes with training, but I estimate um, what my portion size is going to be, right? So let's say that I'm going to have a party for 20 of my friends, uh, and I know that I want to feed each of them uh, four ounces of beef. Um, then I do the math, right? Four ounces times 20 and so on. Um, but one, one way that I like to, to use when I cook at home, especially, uh, when it's only for, you know, two or three people or, or so on, um, I like to buy a portion already, you know, because let's say for example, salmon, rather than buying a side of salmon at, at the grocery store, uh, where I'm going to have to break it down into a portion size, and then I'm going to have the, the, the treatments and the waste and everything else. Um, I buy I buy salmon that's already um, portioned out, you know. Then I may pay a little bit more because I'm paying the the grocery store to portion it for me. But uh, then I know that I only need to buy 20 of those, and there won't be any waste. And so that's one two of the ways that I like to um, try to control that. Great, thank you. And then so another tool, if you are like me and you're overwhelmed by all that math of thinking about okay, so I can do the math quickly for the beef. Um, but then what about all these vegetables and what about every other thing that I was hoping to serve and the appetizers and the desserts? Um, I would encourage each of you to check out the tool called the guesstimator. Um, and I'm going to share a link for this um, in a follow-up email. So you'll all see um, the quick links to find this online. But you can see this screenshot in the bottom right here. Um, this tool will walk you through every part of your meal and say, okay, um, do you know what you want to serve? and then ask you, what's your vegetable? How many people are you having? Would you say that your friends are big eaters or small eaters? Um, and kind of helps you kind of work your way through the process so that at the end, you have a really concise grocery list that says you need four pounds of beef and two heads of celery or whatever the case may be. And so that's a really useful tool. Um, and then, so another topic, um, kind of moving away from estimating quantities a little bit here, um, is thinking about date labels. And so as a food waste expert and somebody who works in the field, um, I've learned a little bit of information about date labels um, that makes me kind of think of them differently in my home atmosphere. And so um, across the United States, there is only one food that has a, regu a federally regulated date label, um, and that is baby formula. And so it's interesting to think, um, what are all the different factors that are at play when we look at these date labels? Um, are they consistent? About 20% of um, consumers report, or 20% of food waste um, is estimated to be due to confusion over date labels. And so, Chef, tell us a little bit about your experience with date labels and what and how you approach them. Yeah, great question, Lucy. So, um, I used to work for a food manufacturer, right? And um, when I went to work for them, I learned a lot about food labels and 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 so on. And one of the things that that I always um, talk about is um, the the lay la day labels are very arbitrary, right? Um, you see best best buy or use buy or um, you know freezer or consume buy, um, and really what that is is just the company um, telling the consumer that that this is the the best date that the company believes is when their products are going to be at their best. So for example, when I was working with um, an international food manufacturer, it's a brand that everybody will, will recognize, um, we label all of our containers, all of our product as um, a best buy date, right? Um, but really what that meant was if, um, if the product say best buy January 1st, that just meant that that's when we thought it was going to be at 100%. And we wanted you to have our product at 100%. That didn't mean the product was bad. Uh, the next day. So if it was Best Buy January 1st, it didn't mean that it will spoil uh, magically on, on January 2nd. Um, we just thought, you know, we don't want you to have our product at 99.5%. We want you to have it at 100%. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. Now, how do I, you know, at home, how do I combat that? 
um, trust in my senses, right? Uh, I know, you know, I know what a uh, spoiled milk smells like. I know what, um, you know, spoiled seafood smells like, or, you know, rotten chicken and so on. So, um, take, you know, trusting your senses, smelling, tasting, um, and being able to be comfortable in making those decisions and saying, you know, it may be a day past the date, but it's still good. And the opposite is true, right? So let's say you have uh, milk that says Best Buy, you know, July 4th, and now it's June 4th, and, you know, you think you have a month, uh, but you don't know that there was a, a trailer that was carrying, broke down in the middle of the heat in Arizona, and that milk was spoiled before you even got it, right? Yeah. Um, so, so one thing I learned is going by that is it's not a gospel. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think. Um, it's very easy in, in our data-driven world. We know all of these, uh, all this information that's bombarding us. Um, it becomes easy to just trust what you're told and not think back to um, these very rudimentary skills that we all have. We all know the taste of bad milk. You know that you're not supposed to put that in your body. And so things like that, trusting your touch, your taste, your your smell, um, to tell right. you when when to not eat your food, rather than relying purely on these date labels. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and so um, we have one more topic to cover in this prevention category. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to ask Andrew to, to share another survey question with us. You know what, Lucy, <clears throat> before we jump into there, I've got a couple good questions that have come in. Why don't, why don't I throw a couple of them at you? Um, I've got a question. Somebody asks about um, using your garbage disposal and what happens to that material. They've heard that maybe that's a better option than throwing food waste in your trash can. Yeah, so here in Central Ohio, um, our, our system is set up such that if you have excess food or some milk that went bad, um, you should actually go ahead and put that down your garbage disposal because um, it'll then be processed and be made into soil amendments. So it's essentially kind of a different method of composting that food. Um, so when possible, you can go ahead and put that material down the garbage disposal, make sure you run it through with plenty of water so that it doesn't cause any plumbing problems. Um, but that's a great method for food waste reduction at home. That's a great question. Let me, let me, have, let me throw a couple more at you. Um, I've got somebody asking about those speci specialized storage bags for produce that kind of um, help manage the ethylene gas that's produced and just whether those are also an effective way or, or in help in some manner? Yeah, that's a great question. And I might um, put that one to Chef Mojica to see if he has any more technical knowledge. I think mm -hmm. my understanding of those um, those technologies is that uh, they can vary significantly in, in quality. Um, I'm sure some of them, if you, um, with the right ones in the right circumstance, I'm sure that they do help. Personally, that's not something that I use. Um, but Chef Mahika, I'm curious, is that something you've tried in any of your kitchens? It has not, and I'm on the same boat as you. Um, I think some of them are uh, you know, very spoon quality, but I've never personally used them before. So um, I will just echo what you said. Yeah, yeah. great comment. Um, and I'm just, and I'll make one comment just because I do have a question here from somebody that doesn't live in Franklin County. Uh, and it's really something I probably should have mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, which is um, Swaco, Swaco's jurisdiction is Franklin County, Ohio. Uh, I know that sometimes for our webinars, people from outside of Franklin County also participate. It's wonderful, we're happy to have you. And many of the things that we talk about are gonna be universal um, in terms of food waste in your kitchen and things like that. But um, our programs and things like that that, are, that we're talking about are specific to Franklin County. So. Um, you can always email us and we can there there are solid waste districts throughout the state of ohio so no matter where you're coming from where you're where you're watching this tonight we can connect you with the solid waste district in your region so email us after the presentation we'll try to hook you up great and thank you for joining us um okay and then i'll jump back in we have our last prevention question before we shift into the next topic um oh and the poll sorry andrew i um, forgot where we were headed there, but if we have this poll question um, before we get into the last topic. So, um, Lucy, I'm going to launch the poll, and then why don't you read the question out loud when it when it pops up on the screen for everybody? Yeah. 
Okay, so our poll question here is how much money do you think that the average family of four spends on food that they end up throwing away each year? So this is essentially how much money can you save by reducing your food waste? And so we'll see if we're getting some answers coming in here. Andrew, status update. Yeah, we're getting lots and lots of votes here. Lots of uh, participants were at 60%. Let's see if we can get a few more people to send their guess in. I think it's slowing down. So let me close the poll and let's see what people think. Okay, let's see. I can't quite see that very well, but the number we have here is about $1,500 every single year is wasted by the average family of four on food that they do not eat. And so um, that kind of just helps give a little extra motivation when you're thinking about your wallet um, and your food waste together. Um, you can save a lot of money by preventing food waste. And so with that in mind, um, Chef Mojica, let's talk a little bit about um, things that you do when you are shopping at the grocery store that help you to save money. Um, so one of the things that I do is I, I like to buy um, like to buy uh, IQF or individually quick frozen product, right? What that is is product that's um, frozen at its peak uh, freshness, and um, what that does for me personally is it helps me get uh, get that product to be as fresh when I need it, um, you know, ready for me without me having to worry again. Uh, if I buy a salmon, I know I have to eat it within the next two two days or three days, and or else it'll go away. But if I buy a pack of IQF salmon, and then I know all I have to do is to buy one. Um, sometimes that's, that's a lot more affordable as well um, than fresh product. Uh, and then another thing that I do is, again, we talk about utilizing everything. So I try to utilize as much of the um, the product that I buy uh, in various ways so that I, um, you know, in more than one application or more than one dinner. Great. Yeah. And so just to summarize kind of, what that could mean for us when we're walking through the grocery store. Um, buying in bulk is a great option for saving money. And so if you're thinking about your week, you know you wanna eat yogurt for breakfast every day, um, you could save a lot of money by buying a, a pint container rather than the individual packages and as well as reducing a lot of waste. Um, and then also thinking about fresh versus frozen. So frozen foods are often overlooked by um, those who are thinking that fresh is always better, but um, as freezing techniques have evolved over the years, um, now you can potentially get fresher food by, buy, by shopping in the freezer aisle. Um, and so with something like individually quick, quick frozen foods, um, help you maximize that freshness as well as have something that's going to be ready to go whenever you need it and not go bad in the next couple of days if you don't get to it when you planned. So that's great. Um, thank you for the questions that were submitted about prevention. Um, feel free to keep those coming as we move forward, but we're going to begin to transition into a conversation about food storage, food, re food rescue, and food recycling. Um, and so our first question here for Chef Mojica is, what is one food that home cooks often store incorrectly, and how do you store it? Um, great question. So the first one that comes to mind, Lucy, is butter. Um, People, you know, people think of, of butter as being dairy and therefore having to be in the refrigerator. But um, I personally keep my butter in a room temperature at home. Um, so I find it keeps a little bit better, uh, but I also find that the flavor keeps better as well. Um, and it's just always ready to go. I don't have to waste the energy and the gas and the, you know, heat and all of that to, or the electricity to, to melt the butter, right? So that's one yeah. thing. And then um, tomatoes and bananas, or another one that people tend to uh, again we associate fresh with having to stay you know having to stay in the refrigerator and so something like a banana like an apple will actually uh, or a tomato will hold better if it's a room temperature than if it's at under refrigeration yeah and so this is one like tomatoes especially i think i didn't realize um that you weren't supposed to store those in the refrigerator because it'll kind of diminish the flavor and so i think this kind of points out, I mean, some of us, we've been doing this our whole lives, storing tomatoes or butter in the wrong place. Um, this is just a great place to point out that food storage is really important and not all foods should be treated the same. And so there are all kinds of resources out there um, from everyone from the USDA to nonprofit organizations who are trying to help you reduce your food waste that can help you for, with um, 
food storage guides to keep all of your foods fresh. And so I'll follow up in an email um, after this webinar with some of those resources to get you started. Um, but also just kind of a follow-up question for Chef Mojica. So it sounds like in these examples, these were all things that we should actually be pulling out of our refrigerator, which I find surprising. Um, would you say that we have a tendency to overuse our refrigerators? I think so. Um, I think that we we do. And one of the items that comes to mind when I when when I think of that is bread, right? Um, people, you know, we will buy a loaf of bread, uh, and we about two or three days later we put put it in the refrigerator to make sure that it doesn't um, that it lasts just a little longer, right? We again want to avoid food waste and so on. But um, what that does is actually the, if you put it on the refrigerator, uh, the the bread goes uh, it becomes stale faster, and so one thing that we do is we keep all of our bread in the freezer. And so that will make it last longer, um, pull out a couple slices at a time or a loaf at a time or whatever we need. Uh, and, and we do it that way. So that's one of the things where, where we are under, under utilizing the, the freezer, if you will. Yeah, and so um, as we're looking at reducing our food waste at home, um, for me in my own life, my freezer has become my best friend. Every time I have leftover soups, every time I have um, some extra fruits that, that are going to go bad that can then become a meal for whenever I need it. If I'm running out the door and don't have time to make dinner, I can pull out one of those soups really quick, um, just pop it in the microwave. Or things like frozen fruits can become smoothies, um, as well as frozen vegetables, all kinds of things that we can do there um, if we are better utilizing our freezers. Correct. Um, and then, yeah, and so another question that I know um, is often on a lot of our minds, uh, if we're trying to be healthy eaters and we're buying more produce, especially things, leafy greens, spinach, lettuce, kale, um, these items tend to uh, wilt and decay very quickly. Do you have any tips for us on how we can keep those items fresh for longer? Yeah, so so great question, Lucy, right? Um, one of the things that, that we like to do at um, in the kitchens that, that I've worked at, um, so for greens, we um, when we receive them, we keep them in the package that they come, right? Usually it's some sort of plastic bag that has, uh, you know, little holes poking into it so the, the, the greens can breathe and so on. So we try to keep them in those containers until we're ready to use them. Um, once we are ready to use them, uh, whatever we have left over, instead of wrapping it tight, again, people associate with, you know, we want to keep it Close, tightly closed, it doesn't spoil, they last longer and so on. But what that does actually creates um, a bigger potential for like, especially the greens to go bad faster. So one thing that we do is we keep them loosely wrapped um, so that they have some air there, you know, they're breathing, living um, plants after all still, right? So we give them that room to, to breathe. Um, if let's say what, you know, a couple of days have gone by now and we see, start to see that they are still, you know, wilting, but they're not spoiled again. Um, one thing that we do is we uh, shot them in ice water. And so what that does is that brings them back up to life, right? That will make them crispy again. It will bring up their color again and so on. And so it's able to, we're able to utilize that um, without having to, to throw it away just because it doesn't look as great, um, you know, before we bring them back to life, if you will. Yeah, that's a great tip. I think, um, for many of us, those greens are really frustrating because um, you had this intention to eat them up and then it, they don't quite look as good when you're ready to use them. So um, I think this ice water tip is a great is a great one to use at home. Um, but it kind of also, I think, points out for me at least, there are all these really specific tips and tricks for lettuce or a tip for apples or a tip for bananas. But um, how can we think kind of holistically about our refrigerator um, for most foods um, about keeping them stored as long as possible. And so my question here is, um, does cooking foods help them to last longer in the re refrigerator? So for example, if I buy beef, um, does it make more sense for me to cook it right away um, or to wait until I'm about to eat it and then cook it? Or will cooking it help it to last longer? So great, that's a great question, Lucy. So it's actually a combination of, right? So um, to your example of beef, uh, if you're buying beef in bulk, right? Um, I would recommend waiting until you're ready. You know, you buy it on Monday, you're gonna eat it on Wednesday. So uh, leave it in the package. The package is designed to keep it fresh, right? Um, or most packages are. 
and then when you come to, you know, on Wednesday, you cook whatever, you know, whatever portion you're going to cook. Um, and now you have the leftover. So maybe give it a couple more days. If you then know that you're not going to use it, then at that point, then you want to cook it and then freeze it so it will last you longer, right? Or um, if you know from the get-go that, you know, you bought it on Monday and you know you're only going to, you know, you buy a five-pound bag, let's say, and you know you're only going to cook one pound on Wednesday, uh, break it down to smaller pieces, right, into smaller portions, keep one pound fresh that you will cook and then store the other one right away, freeze it right away. So a combination of um, the things you said is, I think, what works best for us. Great. And so I guess in that answer, it comes back to that foresight and thinking about um, being conscientious with your grocery list for the week, um, identifying, right. oh, I had plans come up for Wednesday night, so I'm not going to cook that dinner that I had planned, so let's put it in the freezer. Um, and so can, maintaining that foresight and that thinking about your week's meals. Correct. Um, Lucy, then, Lucy, Lucy, can I uh, interrupt you for a second? Yes, of um, course. I'm getting a, uh, some really good questions that I just think are kind of in the spirit of what you're talking about here. Um, so I just wanted to throw a couple of them at both you and the chef. The first one is just a, very much related to what you said. I've, I've got a question from Tamara. She says, are there gr any grocery list planning resources that are helpful in reducing waste? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, so when we have launched this Save More Than Food um, website and resources, there will be all kinds of those um, tools for, available for you to use on that website. But until that's launched, I would recommend that you go to the Save, it's called Save the Food. So very similar to Save More Than Food, but um, Save the Food is a um, it is a campaign of the Natural Resource Defense Council, and they have all kinds of shopping lists. Um, they even, if you are looking for help with doing a meal meal prep or meal planning for your week, um, they have some pre-made meal plans, or they can help you design your own um, around your needs. And so absolutely check out savethefood.org, um, and they can help you with some of these tools and templates. We've got one one more, and then I'll let you get back uh, to the to the rest of some of the information you want to present. I've got a question for the chef. You would talk about freezing bread, and uh, I have a question here from Melissa, who says, "Doesn't freezing bread crystallize the starches?" I, I'm not sure I even know what that means, but I, I'm sure that you do. So. So it does if it's not frozen properly, right? Um, we keep it in the original container. Um, we try to keep it if if it comes, let's say, in a, you know, a loaf of bread comes in a plastic bag inside a, a bag. So um, we freeze it right away. One thing that will help prevent that is um, the, so the temperature changes, right? So if it's already frozen, don't throw it out and then refreeze it. But that's... Um, as long as it's stored properly and it's kept in uh, as close as tight as possible, it will it will um, uh, it will help prevent that. You know, you're, she's right. It does it does cause some of that, but um, if you know how to control it, then you have a better chance of, of making it last longer. Yeah. So was that seal the container very carefully with your bread? Right. Um, so maybe put it in a Ziploc bag or something like that. Correct. Right. And I think another another pro tip for freezing your foods, I know I've learned this one with breads, um, it's very helpful to pre-portion them out into the sizes that you will use um, because it's going to be very hard to slice up a frozen loaf of bread. So um, with bread, you'll want to pre-slice it with other things like maybe a chili. You can put it into your single serving containers before freezing it. Um, that'll make it a lot easier to use it up when you're ready. Correct. Yeah. Andrew, do we have any other questions at the moment? Well, let me just ask you one more. We have some great questions, but I'll just maybe throw one more out at you just because I think it's a it's a good one. Um, Tony asks, he says, I understand that plastic yogurt containers are not recyclable. What are some ways that we can enjoy yogurt more sustainably? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think um, for me personally, I have tried a couple different methods. I love, I'm a yogurt eater myself. Um, yogurt is a really easy food to make at home if you're interested in trying that out. Um, it's really just a process of heating up milk and then adding a little yogurt to it and keeping it at a steady temperature for 12 hours. So that's really easy and can be a fun activity um, if you're an experimental chef. Um, if that sounds like too much for you though, um, another one of these methods that I mentioned earlier is that example of, um, I know I have yogurt every day. 
um, I can reduce a lot of that plastic waste by buying the larger container um, because I know I'll use it up. I'll be eating out of it all week. Um, so, I mean, those are two great methods. I, if you have a follow-up question um, about something a little more specific, I'm happy to address that as well. But thanks, Tony. Lucy, if I may add one thing, um, yeah. I do these at home all the time. Um, we use the, I use the containers at home, right? So I buy, I eat yogurt every morning. And so I buy yogurt in a gallon container. Um, I save those containers. And so if you look at my refrigerator, everything that's currently stored there, it's stored in either some sort of a deli container or a mayonnaise container. Or, so I, I, as a way to re recycle the container itself, I use those for food storage. Yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you for adding that. For me, it's my peanut butter jars. I love, I buy a particular type of peanut butter because I like the jar and then I continue to use those um, for years, really. Great comment. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And we'll get back to um, remaining questions in just a moment, but we have the last couple questions, or a couple questions for Chef Mojica. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about um, creating this vegetable stock or this bone stock um, to make soups with. Um, what are some of, um, this is something that's really easy for you to do as a chef because you are you're producing food scraps all day long, producing so much food. What can we do at home if we don't produce enough in one day um, to make our stock that day? Yeah, so that's a great question, Lucy. So one of the things that um, I do at home is I, I keep a bag in the in the freezer, right? So I'll I'll get my vegetable peelings, my you know trimmings of my carrots, and you know whatever the case may be, and I I keep them in my freezer, and I just collect them over the you know the the weeks, and and once I have built enough, uh, or once I have enough uh, trimming saved up in the freezer, then I pull them out and I'll make a stack. So that's one way you can do it. Um, uh, we used to do it at the restaurant all the time. We had a, a five gallon bucket um, at the restaurant in our, in our cooler. And so our cooks go around and they drop all their, all their trimmings into there. And once we have a five gallon bucket, then one of us will make a stack. But at home, you know, I just use a Ziploc bags. And uh, once the gallon Ziploc bag is full, I have enough to make about a quart of a vegetable broth. Great. Great. I, that's a great comment. I think that makes it a, a little easier for those of us who aren't producing so much scrap in, right. in just one day. Um, and then last question here is, are there any foods that should not be stored next to each other to make them last longer? So um, I know I've heard some things about bruised apples or where are you supposed to put them and anything like that. What's your comment on storing foods next to each other? Yeah, so so losing one of the things that you know you're right. The the apples are one of them. Bananas are another one. Um, as they start spoiling, they start releasing gases that will you know we heard the, the phrase uh, one one bad apple spoils the bunch, and so uh, those are two examples of items that uh, you know if you see if you have ten bananas on your counter and you see one of them starting to uh, to go bad, maybe you want to pull that out and then uh, that will prevent the other ones from going bad as well. And you know same thing with the apples. Great. Thank you, that's helpful. So we just, we pull out that one that's beginning to spoil, try to use that right. one up first. If you're not gonna use it up right away, store it a, 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 just a little bit separate from the others. Correct. Um, and so that's kind of our question segment here on storage, rescue, and recycling. I'm gonna open up the rest of our time here to any questions from the audience, questions for myself or Chef Mojica. And Andrew, you can share any of those. Yes, yes, it took just took me a minute to unmute myself, Lucy. Um, yeah, let's um, let's see if we can get a, a few more questions in here. The other thing that I would encourage folks to do is if you have some some tips of your own in terms of storage, um, reuse, uh, even even kind of leftover recipes, anything like that, we would certainly be interested in your thoughts on these. Um, one thing I was going to mention uh, both to, to you and to the chef is that. I found that for me, um, when my one of my kids was about 10 years old, got interested in cooking, and one way that that we could use leftovers and really maybe teach that idea of reusing these things is that um, just taught them how to make an omelet, and then you know after almost every meal we've got a little bit of mushrooms, a little bit of onions, a little bit of something, 
we would set that aside and we'll and just say, hey, we'll, we'll make that into an onlet the next day. So that was a very fun way yeah. to not only use up some waste, but maybe teach that that idea um, to, to, to my one of my sons. Yeah, that's a great idea, Andrew. Um, we we had I used to work at a private uh, country club in, in New York, and that was on our menu. We had amulet of the day, and that's that's what that was. It was all the all the odds and ends of vegetables and so on that we had left over from the night before that were still fresh. Uh, we will use those for for amelie. <laughs> so, yeah, great idea. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, sure. To your point earlier about storing food, to um, I think sometimes too where we lose uh, accidentally create food waste is not storing items properly. Um, one of the things I tell all my cooks uh, when when they come to work for us is um, uh, learning the, how to properly store the food, right? And um, so one thing that I like to share is that uh, you know you buy a pound of beef and you know naturally there's a little bit of blood dripping and you just happen to drip uh, beef blood over your tomatoes and now that creates you know now you don't want to eat the tomatoes right yeah. so one tip that I like to share with people is um, think of the animals uh, if you're eating beef meat um, by height right so we know that chickens are small and so they go at the bottom of the refrigerator. Uh, and then the the veal is a little uh, the, the pork is a little taller, so the pork goes over the chicken, and then the veal is a little taller than that, and the beef is a little taller than that, and then the fish flies over all of them. So that's one way to store it to prevent food because so it's really corny, but I share that with my cooks all the time, and I just find that that's a good way for them to remember where they should be putting items. Yeah, yeah. So that's an important one in keeping that food safety and contamination right. low in your refrigerator, storing those in the right order, thinking about height. I think that's a great tip. I'm also sharing um, kind of a general food refrigerator storage guide in our follow up email. And so you can look out for that as well. But I think Chef Monica's um, example here is a great, easy way to remember it. I've got some great tips and some great questions coming in. So I'd like to jump into a few more of those. Yes. Um, yeah, um, Nikki Lemon makes a comment, and this is, I think is a great idea. She says, um, I had some bad apples starting to go, so I made applesauce. I even included some strawberries that were starting to turn. It was super easy and delicious. What is yeah. What do you have to say about that, Jeff? That's great. That's that, and that's exactly what we try to you know do at work is is utilize them for you know um, one of the things that we do is uh, along those lines with berries the all the strawberries, raspberries, blackberries are starting to, to go, we freeze them. Uh, and once we have enough, we'll uh, puree them up and we'll make a dressing out of it. We'll make a salad dressing with mixed berries. So I think those are great ideas. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I've got a couple really interesting questions that, that I certainly don't know the answer to. One is coming from Hannah, it says, is it a good idea to keep salad greens in the plastic containers they come in from the grocery? Or should we take them out and repackage them in plastic with holes with air to make them last longer? And very similar question from Kim is, is it better to wash all the grapes or blueberries at once or in portions um, as we eat them? So great questions. Um, I So the first question about the greens, um, I like to keep them in the in the bag that they in the plastic bag that they come in until I'm ready to use them. Right. Uh, once I break that seal of the bag, um, one thing that we do, and you know, and I realize that you know, not everybody has, um, you know, a ginormous, you know, refrigerator the size of a living room like we do at the restaurant. But um, uh, we go to we go to the grocery store, we go to Walmart, and we'll buy uh, those uh, plastic shoe boxes, uh, wash them, sanitize them, the whole nine yards. And that's what we use to store our greens uh, after they come out of their container. That keeps them, the seal will keep them fresher um, and it will, the room itself will prevent them from uh, crushing each other. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, I'm sorry, Andrew, remind me the second question, the second part of that question. The, the second question was, is it better to wash all the grapes or blueberries at once or as we are using them? Um, that's a great question. I prefer to wash them as we use them. Um, again, I find that sometimes by incorporating liquid or, or water into it, um, sometimes if you don't dry it properly, if it's not you know stored properly, you run the risk of them spoiling actually faster on you. Um, so I like to I like to um, wash as I go. 
Got another tip here that I think, yeah, I think another good tip for people to, to know this is this one is coming from Linda. Um, she says, I never have a banana go to waste when it starts going bad or over ripening. I peel it, put it in a container in the freezer. I use it later for banana bread, a smoothie, or in my daily oatmeal. Yeah, sounds delicious. Yes, it does. That's a good one. Um, I've had a number of questions come through throughout the presentation about composting. Um, we don't have time today to get into those. Um, I'll just remind you, Lucy, you had mentioned earlier in the presentation, we've got a number of resources available uh, at Swaco.org, uh, some videos, some printed resources, and some other resources. We partner with uh, some local agencies to, to do composting training and different things like that. So get on Swaco.org, uh, shoot Lucy an email. She'll show her email address at the end of the presentation. We'll, we will hook you up with a lot of different resources on composting. Yeah, and just to add to that quickly, um, we have a partnership at Swaco with the Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, you can sign up with them for trainings on how to compost in your backyard, um, as well as we offer a rebate program if you're looking to buy composting equipment, um, you can get some money back on that process as well. Um, so that's a great place to start if you're looking to compost at home. I have another, I think this is a challenge question for the chef. Um, I, have, I think it's a, a good one. Tamara asks, what do you recommend stocking in your pantry to help use up other fresh foods? Like what are, what are the kind of go-to things to have in your pantry to help you use up the, those extra things? Uh, that is a great question, uh, Tamara. Um, I always have uh, fresh herbs laying around um, just to, you know, season my, my food with. Uh, I, like to, I like to have chives and parsley around and what I do is I'll, I chop them real fine. And uh, like one of my vegetables, I always toast vegetables with fresh herbs uh, before serving them. Uh, pasta is a good one, right? Everything goes with pasta. Um, eggs, you know, you mentioned the the omelets earlier. Um, every, you know, an omelet, you can put pretty much anything on an omelet, and, and it'll be a great omelet. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. Uh, you know, they are easy to to put just any ingredient into, and um, um, and be able to to have a good meal. You know, a great question and great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Well, um, I think we are a little over our time here, so we may have to wrap it up. Um, so if there are still questions that we didn't get to today, um, feel free to shoot those over to me at lucy.schroeder at swaco.org. I'd be happy to answer those questions and connect you with Chef Mojica to answer those questions as well. Um, also, uh, as Andrew was discussing, Swaco has all kinds of resources on a wide assortment of waste diversion topics. Um, we're happy to answer those questions as well at info at swaco.org. Um, and so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. It was great to get to have these, this dialogue with you and to hear your questions. Um, and I'll give Chef Mojica just one last, if you have any closing comments for us before we hop off today. No, just thank you for having me, Lucy. And, uh, you know, thank everybody for joining us. And, you know, I'm glad to be here. And it was it was really fun. So thank you for having me. Chef, we, yeah, we really appreciate it. I do have one more question for you. Ask very early in the presentation, somebody that is interested in learning more about the classes that you offer, where would they go to find more information about those classes? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you can go to um, www.cscc.org. Uh, I'm sorry, cscc.edu. I apologize www.cscc.edu so that's the the college's uh, main website uh, and on that website you can search for the the culinary arts uh, management um, degree uh, if you're interested in in credit classes you can also reach out to uh, Ray Leib Harper uh, who is our student recruiter so she can help you through the process of um, but getting information about the program and, and so on. Uh, if you're looking for non-credit classes and those recreational classes, if you will, um, we uh, you'll go to the, the mix.cscc.edu, um, or if you Google it, it'll be the mix at Columbus State. Um, so those are uh, where you'll find more information. That's great. Thanks. Chef, I'll go ahead and include that link in our follow-up email as well. And I think that's an awesome resource for all of you home chefs out there looking to learn more. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
you if any questions as well, you can link up with Lucy and she'll she'll put you in contact with me. So wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Chef Mojica for taking the time to offer your expertise. Um, and uh, good luck with your food waste reduction at home. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you both for, for participating as well and, and all of our guests tonight. You'll be receiving a little survey uh, at the conclusion of this. We would love for you to take a couple minutes to answer some questions so we can continue to improve these. And as Lucy said at the beginning, we're doing these every month, these webinars, waste resources webinars every month. Um, so if you enjoyed it, um, we encourage you to keep a lookout for the next one that we'll have scheduled and in invite your friends and family to join us next time. So um, thanks everybody. Great, have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.